Welcome to Joe's Productions. Today we're taking a look at the rise of a world power, U.S. imperialism, empire, and expansion. If you're studying for any APUSH class, if you're using those books, this video is going to help you get that five on the AP exam. Some important ideas we need to lay out right away is this. Since the 1790s, U.S. territorial expansion has largely focused on Western expansion. We've been moving from the Atlantic to the Pacific coast, and in that we've been dealing with different countries like Mexico and Spain and England and the various Native American groups, but something changes in the 1890s. In 1893, of course, Frederick Jackson Turner says the frontier has closed, the end of the Indian Wars with Wounded Knee in 1890, the 1890s marks a transition in U.S. history. The U.S. becomes a global power. And a couple of things to keep in mind, there's a whole bunch of motives for imperialism. Um, one is economic. There is a desire. Remember, the Industrial Revolution is in full swing. We want to open up markets abroad, new places to trade, not just industrial goods, manufactured goods, but also agricultural ones as well. And U.S. companies want access to cheap raw materials. And you could see U.S. exports going up in each decade to follow. There's also political desires. There's a desire to compete with other nations, primarily Europe, but also Japan over in Asia. We don't want to be a second-rate nation. The countries of the world are carving up Africa and Asia, and America wants to be a world power. And so this drives us to expansion. We don't want to fall behind. Another motive is strategic or military, um, and that is, you know, we want to be able to be a military force. We want to have naval bases around the world. In fact, Alfred T. Mahan, make sure you know him, he wrote a book called The Influence of Sea Power, and he basically talks about you need to have a powerful navy if you want to be a powerful country. And this is going to be a big reason why the Panama Canal is going to be a huge project that the U.S. is going to participate in. There are ideological motives. It's not just the world of business uh, where people are talking about ideas like social Darwinism and survival of the fittest. There's this idea of the white man's burden. And people um, are using Charles Darwin's concepts and they're applying it to international affairs. You have the Reverend Josiah Strong who writes Our Country and he talks about how Anglo-Saxon civilization is superior and we, as Protestant Americans, need to spread our values, our civilization, to the rest of the world. And these ideas are going to be used to justify colonizing other lands to spread so-called superior civilizations. You can see all these motives in the first case study, which is in Hawaii. Hawaii was an independent uh, land, not part of the United States, and in the 1820s, American missionaries start going over there, largely to convert the native people to Christianity. And over time, American sugar and pineapple planters begin buying up the land and basically telling people that this stuff is very profitable over here in Hawaii. The Dole family plays a huge key role in this process around the 1860s and so on. Um, and in 1887, the United States signs a treaty which establishes the naval base at Pearl Harbor. And there's all these different interests in the United States wanting to annex Hawaii. The problem is the people in Hawaii don't want to be annexed overwhelmingly. This woman, Queen Lilikalani, advocated that Hawaii should be controlled by the Hawaiian people. She starts speaking up and a revolt is orchestrated by plantation owners to overthrow her in 1890s. You can see how she is portrayed in this political cartoon. There is a briefly an annexation controversy. Um, Grover Cleveland rejects annexation. Um, he wants to see if the Hawaiian people truly want this, but all that debate will come to an end when William McKinley, under his administration, Hawaii is annexed in 1898. Now, the big event that you should know about is the Spanish-American War. Let me give you some background. And Cuba was one of the few colonies still controlled by Spain. In fact, revolts against Spanish rule were becoming more and more common. Um, people like Jose Marti and other Cubans wanted independence, and Spain wanted to retain their colony, so, so they're sending in large numbers of troops. And they're taking some controversial steps, one by the Spanish general Butcher Whaler, his nickname the Butcher, because of his policy of the reconcentration camps, where Cubans were forced into these camps, and many Cubans die of starvation and disease. Now, you're probably wondering, why does the United States care? Well, the U.S. had a large amount of investments, especially in the sugar plantation industry. 
and there is a sympathy in, amongst the American public for the plight of the Cuban people. And really driving that sympathy is the rise of yellow journalism in the 1890s. Yellow journalism was practiced by people like William Randolph Hearst, Joseph Pulitzer, and it was exaggerated, sensationalistic reporting to attract readers to their, their articles. And what you see happening in these newspapers is this kind of exaggeration of what's happening in Cuba by Spain. So you have all these different factors. Then you get this famous moment where the Spanish minister to the United States, the so-called De Lome letter, where a Spanish official disrespects our president, President William McKinley. And American honor is insulted. But none of that matters as much as this, which happens in February of 1898. The USS Maine, a U.S. battleship off the coast of Cuba, explodes. And right away, you have all sorts of fingers pointing at Spain. The yellow press blames Spain for the destruction of the battleship Maine. You see this in newspaper headlines and political cartoons. And in April of 1898, the United States declares war against Spain. And the Spanish-American War is going to be the U.S., Cuba, and Philippines versus Spain. At the start of the war, the U.S. Congress passes the Teller Amendment, where the U.S., uh, basically declares to Cuba, we have no intention of taking over Cuba. They will control their own government, retain their sovereignty, and we'll see how that plays out as the war ends. Spanish-American War was nicknamed by the Secretary of State, John Hay, as the Splendid Little War. It lasts four months. Only 400 Americans die during the actual fighting. Thousands more will die from disease. Um, it does begin in the Philippines first, Another Spanish colony, George Dewey, an American naval official, crushes the Spanish fleet in Manila Bay. Theodore Roosevelt resigns as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, joins a group called the Rough Riders, there you can see, and the famous Battle of San Juan Hill in Cuba, a huge U.S. victory. And the war ends as quickly as it starts in August of 1898 with, eventually, the Treaty of Paris. This treaty is very important because it's going to spark a huge debate in the United States. And here's the big debate. The Treaty of Paris gives the United States, Guam, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. Spain is paid $20 million, but all those areas, those four new territories, are now under U.S. possession. And the debate is, the impact of the war, the Spanish-American War, is what should the U.S. do with these newly acquired territories? We have now acquired a world empire. There's a huge debate in Congress. You need a two-third majority uh, required to ratify a treaty. And there was a lot of people who opposed the Treaty of Paris. There's a group called the Anti-Imperialist League which opposed annexation of the Philippines and some of those other territories. But the Philippines is going to be the huge controversy. Membership of the Anti-Imperialist League were a diverse group of people. You had Andrew Carnegie, head of the American Federation of Labor, Samuel Gompers, Mark Twain, and others. However, the president at the time, McKinley, favored expansion, and Congress narrowly approves the treaty. And it's important you know about what the U.S. does in Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines following the war. Let's take a look at Cuba. Remember the Teller Amendment. We were going to leave right after the war was over. Well, it is replaced by the Platt Amendment. And the Platt Amendment is passed in 1901, and you can see that in the political cartoon right there. Cuba's freedom is going to be partially blocked. Under the Platt Amendment, the U.S. can intervene to restore peace and order in Cuba whenever it feels it is necessary. Cuba was forbidden, could not sign a treaty with a foreign power that limited its independence, and the United States would be able to maintain a naval base in Cuba at Guantanamo Bay. So with the Platt Amendment, even though the United States officially withdraws from Cuba, Cuba remains a protectorate of the United States, the U.S. will be overseeing Cuba, and there will be a huge amount of resentment amongst the Cuban people. What about Puerto Rico? Puerto Rico also had restrictions on its freedom. The act that you see right there, Puerto Rico was granted limited degree of popular government. However, it withheld full self-rule. Puerto Rico was not going to get their independence completely. Congress does grant U.S. citizenship 
to people living in Puerto Rico in 1917. So thank you for Ricky Martin and J-Lo. But the status of places such as Puerto Rico and the Philippines was still uncertain. And one of the key questions was, did the rights and protections under the U.S. Constitution follow the U.S. flag? Since we are controlling Puerto Rico, do they enjoy certain rights that Americans have in the United States? And in the insular cases, you could see J-Lo's reaction right there. She's not too happy with the Supreme Court decides because in those cases, the court says constitutional rights are not automatically extended to people in American territorial possessions. In other words, they don't have the full rights that Americans living in the U.S. have. And the big one, though, is the Philippines. What happens in the Philippines is going to be a hot mess. Emilio Aguinaldo was the leader of the Filipino independence movement against Spain. He fought alongside the United States during the Spanish-American War, and he thought his country would receive independence when the war was over. In fact, those thoughts of independence were crushed because a brutal guerrilla war takes place between the U.S. and the Philippines. In fact, that war will last three years and thousands of lives will die, uh, many more on the Filipino side. And formal independence would not come to the Philippines until 1946. One of the reasons why the United States was so interested in the Philippines was its close proximity to China. And for a very long time, the U.S. was interested in gaining access to the markets of China. The problem, though, is other nations had carved up China into what were known as spheres of influence. And those were areas of exclusive trading privileges. No other nation was allowed in their particular sphere of influence. So the United States response, Secretary of State John Hay announces the open door policy in 1899. And in that policy, it declared that all nations should have equal trading privileges in China. Now, there was a lot of resentment amongst some Chinese with all this foreign intervention in their country. And in the 1890s, you have an event called the Boxer Rebellion. And it was an attempt to remove foreign influence uh, from China. And you get uh, foreign offices being attacked and Chinese Christian missionaries are killed and eventually it is put down by a international force including the United States and other nations the box rebellion is crushed Which brings us back to Teddy McKinley is re-elected in 1900 Roosevelt was added to the ticket the hero of the Spanish-American War as the vice president and when McKinley is assassinated in 1901 Roosevelt becomes the president. And under Roosevelt, there will be a dramatic rise in the power of the presidency. We'll take a look at what he does as the progressive movement unfolds. But really in foreign policy, Roosevelt, TR, is going to pursue an expansionist foreign policy. One of his favorite sayings was, speak softly and carry a big stick. And in essence, what this means is you're going to use diplomacy often, but you should not back down from using force if necessary and taking decisive action. And you could really see Roosevelt's approach to foreign policy with how he gets the U.S. rights to the Panama Canal. The presence of a canal was dreamed about for many, many years uh, because it would dramatically cut down the amount of time it would take to travel between different parts of the globe. And this would have implications for trade, but also military national security as well. France was the first country to try to formally attempt to build the canal, but ultimately it fails because Panama is a tropical uh, nation and diseases such as malaria and yellow fever kill thousands of workers. Um, and Roosevelt decides when he gets into office that he's going to attempt to get Colombia, which Colombia controls Panama at this time, to allow the U.S to build a canal in Panama. And ultimately, Colombia rejects the treaty that would have allowed the U.S. to build the canal, and Roosevelt decides to take matters into his own hands. What he ends up doing is he decides to secretly support the movement for Panamanian independence from Colombia. So the U.S. would secretly back Panama's independence, and of course, the revolution takes place, Panama is free, and shortly after that, the United States and Panama signed a treaty which gives the U.S. the rights to build the canal. And these actions by Roosevelt were controversial, but nonetheless, the canal project begins in 1904. It does strain the relationship between the United States and Latin America, but Roosevelt is excited. There he is checking out the construction. There it is being built, and by 1914, takes a number of years, the Panama Canal is completed. 
Another important thing that Roosevelt does in Latin America is the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. If you remember in 1823, Monroe Doctrine, basically the U.S. says stay the heck out of the Western Hemisphere, Europe. And the problem that was arising was various Latin American countries owed money to countries such as England and Germany. England sends warships to Venezuela in 1902 to collect money. Santo Domingo owed money. And there's a concern by Roosevelt that Europe would keep intervening. So he responds to this perceived threat by issuing the Roosevelt Corollary. And in essence, he says, the U.S. has the right to in intervene in Latin America. We will be the policeman of Latin America. We will send warships, occupied ports to manage collections of debt or taxes or other things. America's got it. And this dramatically expands U.S. role in Latin America. Various presidents, uh, such as Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson, will send troops to countries such as Haiti, Honduras, and the Dominican Republic, and Nicaragua, under the claim that we are restoring order in these countries. And of course, this is going to further strain relations between the U.S. and Latin America, but also demonstrates growing U.S. foreign presence abroad. And then finally, Roosevelt in East Asia you should know about. Roosevelt wins the Nobel Prize for helping negotiate a peace agreement ending the Russian-Japanese War. Japan basically beats down Russia, and the U.S. is increasingly concerned over the growing strength of Japan in Asia, so they want that war to end. The two countries sign a gentleman's agreement in 1908, and the background is this. Laws in California discriminated against Asian immigrants. There's that nativism again. For instance, San Francisco required Asian students to attend segregated schools. There was this fear on the West Coast of a yellow peril coming and taking over the country. And Roosevelt and Japan reach a compromise because Japan is deeply offended by these laws. And here's what the gentleman's agreement covered. Japan secretly agreed to restrict the immigration of Japanese workers to the U.S. by withholding passports. And TR would pressure California to repeal its discriminatory laws. And that's the background of the gentleman's agreement. And then finally, kind of marking the growing role of America in the world, Roosevelt sends the new fleet of U.S. battleships, the so-called Great White Fleet, around the world on a trip. And this, of course, is to demonstrate the U.S. growing power to the rest of the world. Key idea that you should really take away from the video is the fact that McKinley, Roosevelt, we're going to take a look at Taft and Wilson in another video, they all believed in playing a more active role in world affairs. So know about the actions they took and know about the differences and the similarities between their foreign policy goals. That's going to do it for today. If the video helped you out, do me a favor and click like. If you haven't done so, subscribe to the channel. Tell all your 8Push homies and homegirls to do the same. And if you have any questions, post them in the comments. I'll be quick to respond. Have a beautiful day. Peace.